Hey everybody, it's John Linnell of They Might Be Giants, and I'm here telling the story behind the song on the Consequence Podcast Network. Hello everyone, this is Peter Chotti, your host for the story behind the song, the Consequence Podcast Network series, where we dig deep into two different songs from iconic artists. And today we are joined by John Linnell from the great band, They Might Be Giants. John, good to see you. Hello. Hi, Peter. How you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm good. I, I didn't realize this would be a video chat. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I would have shaved if I'd known, but... Uh... No, nah, but that's the beauty. Uh, that's I'm the beauty. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's beauty. The authenticity of it all. So it's we're... so real. It is very real. So, John, where are you today? I'm in Brooklyn. I'm actually in my uh, in my studio in my basement here. Uh, although I, I've actually completely started taking everything apart. I don't know how well you can see, but um, I am uh, I'm tearing it all apart so that um, a builder can come in and. Uh, build an apartment out of this we've got a really complicated plan here which is i'm moving my studio and we're going to turn this into a sort of bachelor pad for my son ah interesting yes. interesting yeah so so do you use it right now for some of the recording well i can't anymore because I've, I've torn everything apart but right. uh, but yeah I, I was up until yesterday i was um this is where I've been doing home recording. And a lot of vocals that wind up on They Might Be Giants tracks uh, do sometimes get recorded in here. Uh, if the if the if the take is good enough, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll use the I'll use the uh, demo vocal um, and a lot of other stuff gets performed down here. Excellent. So listen, as we were saying a little bit beforehand, as always on the story behind the song, we go deep into two different songs. Um, the first one being one of your most iconic songs and you have several that are iconic, but I chose one. Mm -hmm. And so that will be, um, the birdhouse in your soul, of course, which is a mm -hmm. classic. And then I asked the artist to choose one of their favorite songs. It could be any song. And you yeah. chose if day for Winnipeg from your last album, your 23rd album that was released last year. Yes. So we'll Correct. get into that. Good. But before I, I have to lay out a few accolades for the, band. okay. Okay. So. Multi Grammy winning, uh, obviously with a string of hits. You've released 23 albums, as I mentioned, uh, your last one last year. Known for your, your, your kind of funny, um, non sequitur, um, I, I, a little bit quirky, but very individualistic songs. And also nominated, I didn't know this, for a Tony Award for Best Original Score for the SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants Broadway musical. Yes, correct. Yes. And uh, what's interesting about that is my last guest was Alex Ebert from Edward Sharp and Magnetic Zeros, and he too wrote a song for that same musical. Yes. Well, we ran into a lot of other artists that we knew uh, at the Tony ceremony, and um, it would have been weird had our category won because there was like, you know, 50 people up for the same. In other words... The, the number of artists who were just who were just in the uh, uh, SpongeBob team were was like massive. That's probably why we didn't win. It was just it was just too many people. Well, look, you've um, obviously your music's been involved in a lot of soundtracks, uh, and um, one other one that was of particular note to me because it's very personal to our family is Coraline. Um, my mm -hmm. daughter, who's studied music, and I always kind of managed to work her into these episodes, but she's a huge Coraline fan. And so our father's song was a song that you had written or the band had also, I yep. think you sang it yourself. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I voiced Classic the, I, I was the singing voice of the character that John Hodgman had voiced. Uh, yeah. So I, I felt sort of a weird kinship with Hodgman there where I was, I was, I was trying to represent him as a singer. Uh, it's such a classic movie. It's a great movie. So first, before we dig into the first song, Birdhouse in Your Soul, from your 1989 major label debut, Flood, um, John, take me through a guided, a guided tour of, uh, you know, kind of a, just some of the highlights of how you, st as a young lad, 
how music first attracted you, how you first got into that, and then where you met your your partner and they might be giants. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, let's see. I, John and I met in high school. Well, actually, we met a little before high school, but we became friends in high school. Uh, we were uh, sort of kindred spirits. We worked on the high school newspaper together, but we also hung out and did other creative projects together. And um, I guess we both gradually drifted into doing music. Um, uh, John was very interested in recording. He had a lot of, he had a lot of um, uh, uh, recording gear early on. Uh, so he had, he started with a, with a, one of these, um, uh, I guess it was like a Tascam reel to reel machine. And he'd figured out how to bounce tracks back and forth between the two sides so that you could overdub a whole composition using just the just the two track machine. Uh, and then I was, you know, I was just sort of like goofing around on the piano and other instruments. And I joined my high school concert band on bass clarinet. So we were both kind of, in a way, exploring and, and mostly self-taught. Um, uh, in music and in recording and uh it it took several years to get to this project but we both wound up in new york together in um uh i guess it was 1981 um and we moved into the, the building that our that our friends were already occupying it was like a very inexpensive uh uh tenement building in brooklyn that a bunch of people were all kind of piling into because everybody knew everybody else from from our hometown uh let me ask you can i ask you a question about that so did sure. you did you and john plan on moving in together is that how well, it happened well we we know but we did we did move together we uh i was living in rhode island and he came down from boston and picked me up in in uh, providence and then we drove the rest of the way together to brooklyn and we took um Two two different apartments in this building. Uh, uh, we had different different roommates, but we you know it was all it was just a gang of people from our basically from our high school uh, who were all living in this building. Um, yeah, so it wasn't a coincidence. We we um, we we did we did move down together, but we both had for different reasons. We both wound up coming to New York at the same time. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and so. When you moved in, yes. Um, how did this? How did it come to be that you two decided to actually start making this a project? And right. did it just? Uh, you tell me. Well, it it did begin sort of organically. I was playing in a professional working new wave band uh, that was out of Providence, Rhode Island, and the band had decided to move to New York and and try and, uh, you know make our headquarters in New York. And um, meanwhile, John and I continued doing some of the creative work that we'd been doing together um, and just goofing around, not really having, we didn't have much of a plan. Um, but eventually we decided that um, what we were gonna do was record one of those plastic flexible discs that um, you used to find in magazines. I don't know if, Oh, you're yeah. probably old enough to remember that they, they, they were uh, really inexpensive. Thanks for, re thanks for reminding me, by the way. But oh, yes, you know, I am old it's, enough. It's, I am old enough to remember. Yeah, um, they were they were uh, <laughs> usually advertisements for you know recordings, um, but it was like a plastic, very very flexible, usually printed on black plastic disc that you could you could play on your record player, but you had to weigh it down because it was so flimsy. And we found out that you could you could um, I think it it was an Eva Tone, Eva Tone Sound Sheet Company or something like that down in Florida, and uh, you could press up a thousand of these. That was the minimum number that you could make, and it cost I don't know, maybe it was a thousand dollars. Maybe I, did they cost a dollar each? I, I that seems expensive now. Maybe it was less than that. I can't remember. But anyway, this was this was our idea. It was like we're gonna make one of these and just give them away, you know, and that'll be our that'll be our project. And so that was the kind of the first first thing that John and I um, put together that was like to send out into the world. 
and did so from the beginning did the the um kind of the end of the quirky nature i guess i don't know how better to put it it's the your idiosyncratic nature of your music did sure, that yes. did you did you two share that from the very beginning so I think what that we, became yeah, they might yeah. be I would say we had a shared sensibility and we probably shared it with other people that we grew up with as well. Uh, I think we just wanted to do something interesting and that, that, that was what came out, you know, it was, we, we, uh, we liked pop music, you know, we loved the Beatles and a lot of the pop bands that were coming out at that time. Um, but we also liked stuff that was more oddball and artsy and, um, I think we just wanted to do something. We we had both done other bands that were probably more intended to be appealing to other people. And we wanted to try something that was just something we liked, you know? Uh, so that was the idea was we'll, we'll, we'll just do a project that is what we would like rather than something we think would be actually successful. And uh, that's what <laughs> right. turned into They Might Be Giants. Okay. So, Tell, tell me about that. You started doing this project together and doing it your way and trying something different. Yeah. So what was the first big break of that? Um, well, I mean, it was all very gradual, but um, we had a couple of really oddball, lucky things happen. One was that we made a cassette following the, following the, um, you know, Eva tone thingy, the, the little disc that we made. We made a cassette of, sort of our first set of things and it got reviewed in people magazine which was really odd you know uh, somebody just heard it and decided i'm going to i'm going to write the, i'm going to add this to the music reviews and the regular music reviews in people and that was a year before we got a record deal or anything so that was a kind of just a weird ufo for us that we felt like we were suddenly you know I don't think a million people became aware of who we were as a result. It was just like, it was this thing we could point to, you know? Um, well, people, people magazine back in the day was a very, very big magazine. It was and huge. So, no, I mean, any, any, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, so how you make a cassette and, something like that doesn't naturally find itself into somebody from people magazine. So you must've been distributing it in some kind of way. Oh, oh, we were, we were, we were, um, uh, we were advertising it. We were giving them, uh, well, I can't remember how we, Flansburg is actually would have a probably better memory of how we were actually getting these cassettes out. But, um, uh, yeah, I think we were part of it was we were in New York and we had lots of friends who were sort of in the, you know, arts. And uh, so these cassettes were circulating at that point. And it somehow it got into the hands of somebody who thought it would be cool to review this completely obscure indie cassette in People magazine. Um, and, you know, and we'd started playing, we started performing in public at that time, too. So we were trying to get people to come to our shows who weren't just the friends of ours who were doing it out of out of loyalty to us. Um, so we're coming up with different ways of advertising. And then the next big thing, well, this was before the People Magazine review was, uh, we came up with this idea called Dial-A-Song. And- um, I was that, gonna ask you about that. Yeah. yeah, so that was probably, that was probably only about a year into doing this. We um, got, answering an answering machine which in those days used to be a a big mechanical box that played because this particular one played audio cassettes and it had an outgoing cassette and an incoming cassette so you could um it was ideal for us because you could take uh different songs and put them on different cassettes and then swap them in and out so we'd have different songs try and put on a different song every day was the idea and obviously the audio quality was very, very low, um, but that was okay. Uh, it was, you know, it was people listening to music over the phone, which nowadays is a normal thing to do, but, but back then yeah. uh, it was, uh, you know, it was like a very humble idea to, to have, uh, to produce our songs so that they'd be listened to on the telephone. 
and we advertised on the back of the back page of the Village Voice. Um, you know, it's a, a single line advertisement that just said, "They might be giants." Dial a song, and if you could figure out what that meant, and there was a phone number, you know, I mean, a lot of people just called it because they were wondering what the hell it was, and and uh, uh, you know. That, it was, it's great. That's great. Mark. It's great marketing. That's <laughs> really brilliant, actually. And I was going to ask you, and I want to save some time to the end to start getting into um, the fact that you're ahead of its t your time when it came to doing innovative ways of distribution, including online and the Internet and all that good stuff. And so I want to make sure I get into that a little bit because the tech forwardness of what you do. And I'd like to ask you about some of the Web3 stuff, NFTs, because that seems like a natural, perhaps, to for for what you all are all about. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll okay. go ahead. Give me your reaction. Um, I, I, I think you just talked about NFTs. Is that right? Did well, you I mentioned that as, okay. as one. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sorry, there, was, your voice broke up just for a brief moment. Um, I have to say we're kind of allergic to a lot of that, that kind of stuff. Um, we are, uh, we are not really cutting edge tech people. And, and I think we look for something that suits our project. If we're, if we're looking for, we're, I think we're very ecumenical about how we distribute and send out our stuff. But I think that the stuff that comes off as uh, that comes off as like pure sort of commercial exploitation is something we're, we're very, very, uh, uh, t turned off by. So, um, I would say that in general, we're just looking for more ways to do our, do our regular kind of creative work. And, uh, you know, we've, we've tried out a lot of things, but we are generally not that we're generally not on the cutting edge. We're not the first people that do most of these things we uh we just are very open-minded about what we do i i would say um and i think that uh in the spirit of you know the, the great thing about dial a song for example was it cost the it was the price of a regular phone call and of course none of the none of the money went to us it was it was all going to the phone company uh which yeah. you might say there's nothing particularly noble about that but it was <laughs> we we're i think we were trying to you know, telegraph this idea that we were um, we were something that you could discover on your own, and that um, it wasn't uh, we weren't trying to trying to get you to join our cult, and and uh, you know um, we weren't trying to rope you in. If you if you know, I think if if people if people were interested, if people felt like they personally responded to it, then they were welcome. But it, but basically, it was open to anybody, and it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't an expensive proposition, you know? Yeah, totally get it. Totally get it. I do want to get into the name of the band and you've covered, they might be giants quite a bit, sure. but is it true that you were first called, you first called yourselves El Grupo de Rock and Roll? Um, well, it's, it's actually partly true. It's, we were not even the ones who referred to ourselves that way. It was, we were playing at a Sandinista rally in Central Park. This was the first time John and I had stood up in public and performed. And we had a friend who said, oh, I know where I've got a gig you guys can play at. And it was it was the uh, anniversary of the uh, Sandinista party, the Nicaraguan, uh, you know, um, uh, political yeah. party. And uh, and they just wanted someone to come and play music. So we were like, great, we'll do it. Uh, and I don't I don't know whether we were in any way appropriate, but we um we got up on stage and this guy introduced us in Spanish. Uh, he said, you know, here, uh, you know, please welcome El Grupo de Rock and Roll. Uh, <laughs> that was it. Uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't, yeah. wasn't something we had planned. It was just how we were, how we were referred to. And we hadn't, we hadn't come up with a name at that point. Um, so we had to think of something. Uh, and I guess the, the thing with the name is that you know, it's sort of like one of the earliest decisions that you make. And a lot of bands have trouble defending whatever it was they were thinking. I, there are lots of band names that I love, um, but they usually don't correspond to the band name, the, the actual bands that I love, if you get what I'm saying. In other words, there's, there's mm -hmm. bands that I'm not wild about that have really good names. And then there's some of my favorite bands have terrible names. 
I gotta uh, get, it, I gotta ask you some examples of of both. Okay, well, I, I'm I I I respect the Grateful Dead, but I'm not really a fan of theirs. But I think their 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 name is uh, is one of the best band names that there is. Yeah, uh, and I think yeah. the Beatles the Beatles is one of the stupidest band names uh, in existence. <laughs> But they are probably my all-time favorite band. So you know, that's just how it pans out. Uh, um, I am. Um, I don't. I don't know what the name "They Might Be Giants" means anymore. I don't know what it signifies to anyone else. At the time, it stood out because there were a lot of bands that were uh, using kind of formulaic band names. The, the the names they came up with were supposed to let you know what kind of band it was. You see what I mean? So there was new wave bands mm -hmm. often would take a noun and repeat it, you know, be like, mm -hmm. you know, pencil, pencil or something would be the, that would, at that time, this was, you know, 1981. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then there were, you know, so you get, you sort of get an idea of what the band's about based on the name. That was really the, that was kind of probably the main idea. Uh, and so they might be giants. I think, we were sort of thinking it would throw people off because it wasn't at all clear what what the name meant. It was just, uh, you know, a sort of mysterious idea for a band name at that time. Um, and how do you feel about it today? Uh, like I now said, I, I, don't, later. I don't know. It I doesn't. It, it's sort of the way you feel about your uh, when you look in the mirror, you know, it's hard to even really make sense out of. You're so accustomed to yourself that you do, you don't even yeah. know what you're seeing anymore, and I kind of feel that way about the name. They might be giants. It, it I don't know what it means. Um, I suppose we could have. It could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those those few out there, well, maybe there are many who don't know where that name came from mm -hmm. or how it came to be. Yeah, tell, it's, tell us that it was a movie that was being. Uh, broadcast on TV while John and I were having the conversation about what should we call our, what should we call our band? Uh, there's a movie with George C. Scott and Joanne Woodward. And um, it's just another one of these elliptical, like, you know, that's an unusual name for a movie uh, kind of thing, you know? Uh, so yeah. we just, we just, that was, that was one on the list that we had made. What was number two? Well, I remember we at one point we were thinking of Dump Truck, and there there was another band uh, at some point around that time that called themselves Dump Truck. So uh, we didn't. Luckily, we we dodged that legal right. that legal bullet. <laughs> uh, right. So, John, let's get into Birdhouse in Your Soul. Sure. Which is the your first? I think it's the first single from your your major label debut, That's which correct. was 1989's Flood. Yes. And um, first, before I ask you about the song, was it, was there a, a unusual, was it an unusual transition from being on the indie label to a major label? What was that experience like? Yeah, well, it was, um, luckily for us, it wasn't too wrenching because we'd had a sort of very rapid, but, but, you know, steady uh, increase in uh, our audience on the the first two uh, albums that we'd made, the first India, the two indie albums that we made. Um, so by the time we were on Electra, it was like we were already sort of on the on the ramp, going going out, you know, launching. Um, and uh, we had a kind of a pretty good idea of what we were wanting to do at that point. Uh, so I'd, I'd say it was it was not in, uncomfortable. It was still it was still pretty exciting and surprising how well the third album did. That was that was um, you know we didn't know what to expect. We had we had nothing to compare it to, um, but it was uh, it was it was fun and crazy that year. Actually, I should tell you the um, flood came out in 1990. We we spent the year of the summer of 1989 recording it, and the fall I guess. Uh, and then it came out in the in January of 1990. So it was kind of like the next decade had begun, and we were on this whole new trajectory. Uh, and we had a um, we had a, a a company that had a big international presence, you know. So that made a huge difference. We were able to really get promoted 
in all these faraway markets and we you know we'd show up in countries that we'd never been to and we'd already be established um and uh you know we we're just doing a much bigger touring uh, um had a much bigger touring operation um but we were still us you know i think that the nice thing about flood is it felt like we hadn't really changed what we were doing we were just getting getting better at it and getting more famous at doing it so you know it was good it was it felt good actually yeah that's great and okay so let's dig into the song a little bit do you remember um do you recall how it even first came to be well of course as you said we we've we've talked about this song a lot in the past so i've had to um go back and try and kind of reconstruct some of this um uh, I thought of a couple of new things to say about Birdhouse yeah, for please. your for your benefit. Um, one of them was I was thinking about the lyrics, which are, you know, I don't I do not remember where they came from. They were they were kind of lyrics that you'd make up to a melody that's already been written. That's the way I'd often work. That's the way I still often work. Um, but um, uh, but I do remember I was uh, I think probably partly influenced by this Charles Mingus composition called uh, Better Better Get It In Your Soul, uh, which is from uh, Mingus Ah Um, that album. And it's, it's, I don't know what, again, like, I don't know what Better Get It In Your Soul or Better Get Hit In Your Soul is somehow, is, is, is how it's written. Um, I don't know what exactly what that means, but it, it just felt like a good collection of words um and uh so i just took it in a slightly weirder direction with birdhouse in your soul um well it's, it's pretty it's the first interview i've had where a song comes from the point of view of a of a, of a nightlight, nightlight yeah right? it's a night <laughs> of, a, of a, nightlight. a nightlight and and even though after all these years because I was living in Los Angeles. This song was everywhere. The album was everywhere in 1990, K-Rock, like ubiquitous, right? And so I know the lyrics to the song. Right. But I never thought about it until prior researching this a little bit, that it was actually the point of view from a nightlight. Yes, so that's right. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's one of those things where you, you in my case, I guess, I um, gradually come up with these lyrics and then I, after the fact, figure out what what how to make sense out of them and um so that so there wasn't initially this plan to write a song that's sung by the night the nightlight but it was sort of like well that would be that's an that's a you know a topic that hasn't already been you know <laughs> nobody else has written this so that's a good place to start and so and, let's uh, do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah Exactly. As, aside from that, I would say like a lot of this, a lot of ideas come from the sounds of the syllables of the words, you know, and I, I'm not the only person who writes songs like that, um, that you, that you, you have a melody, usually you start with a melody and then the melody suggests a kind of, uh, set of syllables that work in those, with those particular notes. Right. Um, and then often you you kind of let the song write itself in the, in that way, um, you know. I've written plenty of songs where there's a much more obvious narrative, uh, so there's more than one way to do it, obviously. Uh, and it's funny that Birdhouse was was as successful as it was because it's it's one of the most oddball of all the lyrics of the singles that we've we put out. Um, but uh, there's well, some, so was it an obvious was it an obvious first single for you? I think we knew it was going to be the single. Um, by the time we by the time we'd gotten to recording it, we had demoed it, and um, you know the thing with Birdhouse was it actually was a, a very gradual process writing that one. A lot of songs, um, John and I write songs very quickly sometimes, and those are often the best songs where you have the whole idea at once. And it comes together and you and you know exactly what you're doing. You know, you're it's really obvious when you're writing the song where it's supposed to go. And this was not really the case with Birdhouse. It was more like, here's a melody. What do we do? Like put together, put put these pieces together. And some of the sections were written long after the 
song had been started. And in fact, some of the sections came up in the recording studio when we were working with uh, Langer and with Stanley, the producers, that they would they would say, for example, um, and this was not just Birdhouse, but some of the other songs that um, it's it's the song is good, but it's not long enough. You know, they'd say like we have to get past the three minute mark, so we need some kind of an instrumental break, right? That would be a typical way to do it. And then so we'd go, all right, okay, let's let's do that. Let's let's cook it up. And and we, in the case of Birdhouse, we made up this kind of. Uh, um, it has nothing to do with the rest of the song, but it's this, it, it's sort of an homage to the instrumental break in the Love and Spoonful song, Summer in the City, which has, you know, that has honking horns and it's got this guitar yeah. run and stuff. And it's a really beautiful part of that song uh, that just, it evokes something that's kind of, you can't say it in words, but it just gives you a feeling, right? Um, so that's what we were shooting the, the for. The song, Hot. Hot Town, Summer in the City. That yes, song. that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we we basically stole the chords from that instrumental break. It's the same same chord progression, uh, except it it modulates around a little bit. And then we added these these trumpet uh, stabs um, that were actually sampled um, from a, a, the trumpet playing of a friend of ours, Frank London, who's we worked with a lot. Um, uh, and if I'm remembering correctly, he had been sampled without his permission. So we then sampled those trumpet hits off the record and used them on our record with his permission. So we were basically stealing them back. Um, uh, so that's what that that's what that instrumental break is all about. Um, but it was it, it was put in there at Clive Langer's request. Uh, he he wanted to make the song a little longer. How about that? So, okay, you had a melody well in advance. Yes. And then for some reason, at a certain point, it came back to you and then you started writing lyrics. And I don't, tell us, a, because the lyrics aren't obvious and your methods are not obvious. Yeah. And they're a little bit, like I said, idiosyncratic. Sure, absolutely. And there are, and there are two of you. Yeah. And so how are, are you, do you both share similar sensibilities or how does yeah. it, I think tell, we did. Tell me a I would bit say like, metaf well, part of the process for John and I is that we are conscious of the other person looking over our shoulder. So when either of us is writing, we're thinking, oh, well, what's John going to think? And, and more to the point, what would be, what would like grab him? You know what I mean? Like, I know, I kind of know what I'm doing and I know what I would like, but what could I do to, uh, to blow the other guy's mind, you know? So that's that's a, a big part of our writing process is that we have each other as kind of editors and um, you know people to try and impress you know um, and that's been a really good thing for both of us I think we both feel like it helps it really helps with the whole process to have someone else to bounce everything off of uh, we do a lot of collaboration as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and you were saying that there's there's not really one process that sometimes it's it, it's different for different songs. It's different and, for different songs. And when we talk about If Day, I'll, I'll get into that because that was a real collaboration. Yeah. But uh, but John Flansburg essentially wrote the song. So so um, we'll but we'll talk about that next. I just there's one line in here that just cracks me up and and uh, the filibuster vigilantly like you know how how you come up with that and i guess the way you best describe it is that it's wordplay it's um so, it's 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 what words get fit in with the melody that's already been written you know right um and often i get very uptight about making the rhythms uh consistent um uh you know ralph waldo emerson said something about consistency is the hobgoblin of the small minded or something like that. And yeah, and I yeah, kind of yeah, feel like I, yeah. I do, I do get sort of hung up on trying to make everything follow the strict rhythm. And that often makes the words that forces the words to be more convoluted because I'm sort of obsessed with trying to iron everything out. And then, you know, often, I mean, I have to sort of give up and relax a little bit because 
there just are no words that work perfectly with a given melody. So you have to be willing to be flexible and change the melody a little bit. Um, but I'm always resisting that. And that's kind of, that's part of the tension, I think, for me of, of writing lyrics. And how do you feel about the song today? Well, it's a fait accompli, you know, it's, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's just the thing we do now. It's like breathing, it just is. you know, uh, yeah. uh we, we haven't yeah. had to think about what it means or anything forever because a lot of people, a lot of people in the, in the back, you know, the back of the room are just coming to the show to hear the songs they already know. Uh, and, and usually one of those is Birdhouse. So, so we're, we're duty bound to play, to play birdhouse, you know, or, or, or something as popular as that. So, uh, we're going to be talking about if day for Winnipeg, which is the song that you chose, because again, story behind the song, we, we discussed two songs Yes, and that was your pick. Yes. So, be, so tell, tell me why that song was, well, you selected that particular okay. song of all your many songs. So, so we, uh, well, I, I wanted to pick something from the, the most recent release and uh that is i mean technically it is a john flansburg song he 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 wrote it and he sings it but it was an example of the way that he and i collaborate very often and in fact there's a million different ways that we collaborate so this is just one example of how it how it could happen um but in the case of if day i uh, sent John a lot of audio materials, and one of them was just this odd rhythmic thing that had a, um, well, it was, um, I don't know if I can describe it very well, but it's but it was a, a, a bunch of drums that had been put through a process called ring modulation, uh, which does a really crazy thing to any percussion instrument. And, um, and then it has this funny rhythm where there's sort of a, uh, it's it's kind of like a three against four rhythm if you're if to if you're technical in the in the rhythmic arts you you probably I was a percussion I was a know percussionist that. once so in oh, band okay. so you know what three of oh good no. okay you, so you know what three against yes. four means um, uh, I don't know if you can explain it no. better than that <laughs> I, I can't um, uh, anyway. Uh, so there's that, and there's a bunch of odd sounds. And John, you know, I've done I've done this plenty of times in the past. Given him materials, he's given me materials, um, and then we just use that as the kind of um, the the uh, I'm trying to think of the cooking term that you'd use. You know, the the uh, the base, the mother sauce. I yeah. don't know. Anyway, yeah. uh, the bouillon um, base, the bouillon base of the song. Um, and uh, and so John um, took that and sang over it, and and he uh, was interested in this um, topic, this particular topic that he wanted to write about, which is the uh, the um, traditional ritual in in Winnipeg, uh, in Canada, where they enact um, apparently they enact a kind of um, what if scenario where they, they imagine what if the Nazis had won World War II? I think this, I hope I'm getting this right. Um, and that's why it's called If Day. They imagine what, what if the Nazis had won and then they kind of have a day of, of uh, sort of performative activities involving that as a way i suppose as a way of being grateful that the nazis didn't win the war so they um, so this is something they still do well i don't okay. know actually i'm right. i'm i i know that i know that it was it has been a thing uh and it had a long tradition and i don't know whether it's still going on um but but you said you looked it up so maybe you know well i don't know if they yeah. but i don't know if they still do it but when i so okay. when i heard that you wanted to discuss if day for winnipeg I, yes, that the title itself sounded unusual to me, but it didn't surprise me because yes. you're idiosyncratic. And so some of your titles are, are a little bit, you know, a little bit different and which makes them fun and playful. Um, but so if they for Winnipeg is that's what I understood about it, too. But now let me ask you a couple yeah. of questions about that, because you said that John wanted to do a song about that so do you know why that yes. was in his mind yes i do 
I think he, he felt like, uh, as I do, that we are entering uh, a, a climate now, a political climate now, where um, the a lot of the norms uh, that we that we as old men are so accustomed to are being challenged, and and one of them is democracy itself. We feel like uh, we're we're in a dangerous time where um, where democracy is no longer necessarily accepted as a you know, as a sort of uh, basis yeah. for our society. So I think that's really where he was at. He, he, the The lyric in the song is, um, uh, it, I'm going to mangle the lyric by trying to repeat it, but the idea is that uh, it's not just for Winnipeg. Uh, it's for everybody. Yeah, if, you know, day if day, is, day for is for everyone. If day is for everyone. If day is for everyone, yeah. Meaning, obviously... We're we're all having to imagine losing those uh, those freedoms and the notion of democracy because uh, it seems like all the cards are suddenly up in the air. Um, I don't want to I don't want to put too many words in John's mouth because I think he could articulate this better. But um, that's the basic idea. Um, well, that's it, for the song. It, it, yeah, yeah, and it is unlike Birdhouse there's so much dissonance to the sound itself. And you were talking about, you put sure. the, the percussion or the drums through a ring modulator. So you have this ominous sounding something. Yeah. 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 Well, I didn't have any specific thought about what the sounds meant, but I think John just listened to it and, and kind of came up with, uh, you know, the lyrics based, partly on the feeling of that, I guess. And he added some cool stuff himself. The, 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 the super scary, uh, low brass sound that was that he, he made that. And I still don't know how he made that sound, but I, I that's my favorite thing in the whole song is that crazy, uh, sounds like a tuba, yeah. but it's like a, a tuba from tuba from hell kind of thing. It's ominous. Yeah, it's definitely ominous, but, <laughs> but it makes sense for, and whether it makes sense or not is irrelevant, really, I guess. But, um, but it makes sense from based on what you described, what the song is about. So, interesting. Yeah. Again, you know, we often we often do songs where we're not that worried about the music and the lyrics being perfectly in sync, and sometimes there's some, there's a certain pleasure in them having uh, there being some some cognitive dissonance going on, like some disagreement between the, the, the vibe of the music and the, what the lyrics are saying, you know? And I think you, then one of the nice things is you can often write a song where you get everybody to sort of hum along with the melody. And then they realize the words are something completely in contrast to the feeling of the music. And that's, I, I still really get a kick out of that kind of thing. You know, yeah. I think about there's a song by The Who called uh, So Sad About Us. Uh, Do you know that one? Uh, if you sang it. And it's so sad about us. I don't know that one. La, la, la. I, yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's a lovely song, but it's <laughs> but it's about sadness. Uh, but this, the melody is so uplifting and happy. It's 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 just a beautifully strange marriage of lyrics and music. Yeah. Uh, and I always, I, that kind of thing always re appeals to me. So let me ask you about that though. When you were talking about John shared this with you, first of all, he lives in a different city, I guess. Well, he, he, um, he has his studio in upstate New okay. York. So he does most of his work up there. Um, uh, he, he has an apartment here, but he's, he, he, he can't really make noise in his apartment. So he's, he's got a really nice production studio in this, off in the woods up in upstate New York. And then I mostly work right here in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, in the basement here. Um, so we do a lot of sharing of materials over the internet. That's just a very normal way for us to collaborate. And that's been the way now. you- and It has been for Okay, a long time. it has been for a long time. For a long time, yeah, yeah. And then when you share- There was a time back in the day, I think probably back in the 80s, where one of us would walk to the other person's house 
with a floppy disk, you know. Yeah. So that was the, the highest bandwidth you could achieve was just the walk down the street with the flop with the uh, 1.4 megabyte floppy disk. And, you know, here's the samples and here's the sequence. Go crazy. You know? Yeah. Uh, I remember those but days now well, it's, too. Luckily, <laughs> <laughs> so when he shares or and you share. Um, you said you look over each other's shoulders a little bit. How does that work? I sometimes I, I sometimes I don't know what he's talking about, but I, my sense is that it might not really help to try and pin him down, you know. So we don't we don't interrogate each other too much about stuff unless there's something. I think if there's something that bothers one of or the other of us, we might say not so much what are you talking about, but Maybe this is maybe this is coming off not the way you intended, or you know, I mean, occasionally there's things like that where you're like, I I don't know if this means what I don't know if this will mean the same thing to the world that you want it to mean, and maybe there's a way to make it clearer, or you know what I oh, mean? Oh yeah. Uh, but 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 that's unusual. I would say most of the time, John and I are like, you know, have at it. Sounds great. Do your thing. Okay. So your tour kicks off June 8th of, uh, in New York City, and it's going to be going for many, many dates into 2023, and you're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the band, and you will be, at least on some of the shows, doing Flood, your 1990 album, in its entirety during the, t the tour. That's correct, yes. Um, we, uh, you know, obviously the big concern for this tour, and the reason we've had to postpone it is because of the safety of the audience members and uh, and the concern about the band getting sick from this uh, pandemic and and the, you know I mean the, obviously the stakes are, are kind of high if, if if a member of the band gets sick that pretty much uh, knocks the whole thing on its head so it's a very dicey situation obviously for anybody touring yeah right now um and and uh you know we're we're trying to we've been sort of trying to figure out how to do this uh, um the the month of june is going to be an extremely um low-key beginning where we're doing repeated shows in particular cities so we'll have three shows in DC and then a couple shows up the East Coast and then three shows in New York City. And that'll take us through June actually. Um, uh, so um, we're starting off very low key in other words. And then assuming that uh, everybody's confident and the thing is working out, we're gonna be doing a more typical traditional tour of the United States in the fall. Very cool. Very cool. You know, but you know how this works and it's the same problem for oh. all sorts of bands. Uh, we, we have to be super careful and um, we have to kind of, I guess we have to figure out contingencies. If, if people do get sick, how are we going to, how are we going to handle it? You know, it will be cool to see you on the road again. And before we end things, as I had previewed before, I want to get into a lightning round where it's going to be just couple quick hits yeah. and your your visceral reactions to it. So right. your favorite artistic slash career moment, you know, something that stood out to you. Hmm. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I don't have a favorite, but th there are just occasions when we've been going along a sort of trajectory of, you know, record an album, do a tour, you know, go home, write more songs. There's a kind of a cycle thing that's been going on for the whole history of the band. And then occasionally we just depart from that in some odd way. Uh, and one of the ones that comes to mind is we started writing songs for each of the venues that we performed in. And this was many years ago, um, but we, we would come up with a very quick song at soundcheck, you know, the day of the show and then record it at soundcheck and then perform it that night at the show. And the song would generally take the subject of the either the city we're playing in or the gig we're playing in. 
and then we put that out as an album, uh, and that was called Venue Songs. And so there are things like that that just, I, I think that we keep ourselves entertained often by coming up with ideas like that that are just completely off the regular track uh, of, um, of, of putting out the collection of, most recent collection of songs that we've written and, and then doing a tour to support that, which is fine. I mean, that's, I love doing that as well. Okay, so uh, this is going to be another difficult one probably, but what are you proudest of in your body of work? Well, it's they all the songs complement one another, I think. I don't think there's a particular one that like I would want to strip out and have it stand alone. I think I like the fact that we have done such a such a um, a diverse, you know, eclectic uh collection of 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 songs and recordings and um that's I think I'm proud of the whole thing as a as a as a kind of a you know, I, I like all the obscure ones. I like all the I like all the um, all the deep catalog. Uh, maybe that's what I'm proudest of is that we have a deep catalog. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And if you didn't become an artist, musician, what would you have done? Do you think? Um, well, I was I was really good at this job that I had in the '80s where I was um, I was I worked in something called a stat room, which I, I'm pretty sure there's nothing like that in existence anymore. But I had a, this enormous camera that pointed down and I would photograph art and transparencies and things underneath. And then the stuff, the negatives that were produced on the top were then given off to the art department. They would do whatever they were doing. And this was all part of the process of doing analog multimedia back in the 1980s and probably for a lot of the 20th century before that. But all of it, of course, was made obsolete by computers. Um, so I can't do that anymore because uh, uh, that job doesn't exist. Um, but that was that was the gig. That was my job uh, at one time. I was also a bike messenger before that. Um, uh, so I could go back to doing that, I suppose. I, I, there's probably still there's probably still bike well, messengers. Bike messengers in the have made a huge comeback. Electric bikes, though. And and then finally, finally, who are some artists that you really admire? And not as much icons. You had mentioned the Beatles as an example, but are there any particular emerging artists or art, artists that um, maybe are, aren't particularly mainstream, but you find them to be really, that they speak to you? Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, there's loads. Um, and I could talk about the ones that we were excited about when we first started. Um, you know, John and I were really into the Residents, for example. That was a, a band who just completely broke every norm and, and, and came up with an entirely original way of working. Um, and we were very much into everything they were doing um, as musical artists. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, in a way, it's almost hard to single out somebody because they're often they're so unique and original that they're um that they are not examples of the way anybody else should work you know the great thing about yeah. a lot of these a lot of original artists is that there's no point in trying to copy them you know uh they they were they were doing something deeply personal and uh and um and and presumably those there still are. They still are. I, I'm not very on top of like who's who's who nowadays. Um, uh, but um, but I always appreciate when somebody appears to be completely making it up from from scratch. That's really a, a, just an appe incredibly appealing uh, thing. Well, that's a great listen. That's a great way to end this because there's no question that you all are a band that is one of a kind and. To, for a for an artist or a band to come in and try to copy what you're doing is would feel inauthentic because you are so uniquely you. And so I really enjoyed it. I thought that was great. Um, John, re really appreciate you joining us. So everybody, John Linnell from They Might Be Giants who are going to be touring in a city near you if the world behaves itself and allows it to.